Thank you so much for coming. Um, very pleased to present Justin Long for this discussion this evening. Um, this is, of course, as you all know, the second iteration of the Locust Roundtables. Why are you guys sitting behind me? Come on. <laughs> Come on. And also um, because, Wait. like, feel free to get into the, you know, move in in these tables. Um, anyways, the topic this evening has to do with death, discomfort, um, and I kiboshed the title, but diarrhea. <laughs> but anyways, we're, um, different iterations of that, so let's do it. How's it going? I'm Justin. Um, and for a while now I've had this interest in danger and art and how far can we push the limits and how far have the limits already been pushed. Um, so um, I don't really want to give you like a lecture on danger tonight. Um, but I think we can all like share our own experiences with dangerous pieces and what made them memorable. And if that is a, uh, a validating quality to making a good art piece, say. Um, so I was doing a little research before uh, this talk and trying to figure out why being scared is a good thing and why people seek that out. And it does to your, basically inside your body releases a bunch of uh, adrenaline and then your pituitary gland releases like 30 different hormones um, and kind of like gets this whole crazy thing. So, and it's like a primitive basic um, thing which allowed you to like fight off an enemy or have enough speed to run away from the enemy. So it's also very similar to what happens if you do crystal meth, I found out. Um, so like that's like these similar, like I guess that's why people do crystal meth and it's like the same thing as um, maybe the same feeling as going to a scary movie and um, <laughs> So yeah, can, does anyone else, does anyone here have any um, examples that they have seen an art piece that scared them or? Well, I can think of an artist uh, who's not contemporary, is De Kooning. Okay. Uh, most of his pieces were rather scary in the ways in which he uh, portrayed particularly women but did you feel ever that your body was in bodily harm with the de Kooning painting? No, not at all. <laughs> not so at, I think... All. But I, I wasn't sure exactly what he was asking. Okay. To say that, um, but, it, but it does uh, excite and makes... It could make me nervous. It does make me nervous. It makes me uncomfortable. Okay. okay so. I'll just take the liberty of describing... Um, the, the piece of yours and, and, and Rob's, which includes a, um, a, a 10 foot wide uh, crossbow and shooting two by fours like into walls and there's a, you have to cut the rope with a machete. Did anyone see that? Yes. Okay, was anyone <laughs> afraid for their lives? <laughs> it's def it definitely feels like you're, you feel threatened I don't know if it was like I was scared, but I, uh -huh. I definitely felt like I might get harmed when mm -hmm. this thing goes I, off. I wouldn't have. I would. I didn't think of that piece as uh -huh. really threatening because I, I I saw I saw it as more of like organized vectoring chaos. It's like if it was going to go bad, it was going to go bad that way. But but what they did do once was like the the, 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 the wheel or, or the gravitron. Gravitron. That was truly a piece where you could really get hurt because you had to get on it. <laughs> so, so that was like a, it was a, an artwork that kind of like made you like run the risk of getting hurt, basically. And there well, was that slide too. Right. We, I've made a couple, yeah, dangerous yeah. things. Um, but when the audience actually gets involved, that's where the right. But then, well, how do you feel about that? Where if you go to a place and then you actually have to put some trust into 
the institution that's providing this experience that's for easy. you. That's exactly it. <laughs> so you know, since I knew it was yeah, it was more of a gamble because it was gamble because you had to like because I didn't trust you. <laughs> I didn't trust your engineering skills, but yet That's I did smart. it anyway. <laughs> so it was pretty much a gamble and think, well, it probably won't happen to me. So, so, like, so, that's, uh, so you rolled the dice. I rolled the dice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just cool. I think when our part, that's, that was pretty effective. Well, that's what I, I mean. I've seen, like, over the course of doing a, a couple of these interactive shows where we put the audience in these situations where they basically assume their own liability and push it as far as they want to, it's, it seems like the audience goes way beyond a safe level. And, and I think there's a, there's a problem there where, where the audience doesn't really like, look out for their own safety. They, they feel like we're in this institution and this thing um, should provide us with this absolutely safe environment, but it really isn't. In that case, I mean, I think a lot of times it is like like Dave Cruz really protected. I think the audience from the from the crossbow. And the piece was called "Maintain Right." Yeah. From 2011. Yeah, but I think there was a certain amount of control there. There was a lot of control there. So whatever went wrong wouldn't have been. Right. Well, we had to prove it to them over and over again that it was reliable and the crowd stayed far enough back. But as as we did it over and over again, we were very careless with like not keeping a log of how many times we fired it, and we never did like actual. I think enough research on bending those springs back. Like there was a really good chance that they could have snapped off and swung and cut all our heads off. <laughs> um, Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Well, like we we had some physicist friends of ours to do some numbers for us and they're like well with the specs you gave us there's like anywhere from like 8 to 50,000 pounds of pressure on your bow I'm like that's a pretty big range um, so yeah we're rolling the dice also Said it like some ridiculous number where you needed yeah, like it would be millions like, of yeah. people coming through. I mean, had some other like really wild pieces, like, like said, in addition to shoot piece, you know, like where, yeah, uh, like a TV hijack piece where like bought the airtime. He did an interview with someone on public access, and then like uh, halfway through the interview, he just whipped a knife out and then like held it up to the interviewer's throat and like you know like just basically like had a list of demands, you know, that they would have. <laughs> Uh, comply with you know, yeah. which, like that kind of like interjects with this whole new spectrum of of fear, which like I guess now resonates so differently in 2013. You know, just, yeah. Like, was it scripted? Uh, the interviewer was not aware of it, but like I mean, he knew of it obviously. Okay. So this was just like this seemingly like just hijack situation. Right. It was like under the guise of an art practice, which like, I don't know how that necessarily like validates that. Like, <laughs> you know, like, it's, uh, well, that's a good question. Is like, does using these do, using these tactics uh, validate? Like, how 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 can they be used as a validation method? Like, why is it that holding a gun up to, or uh, sorry, a knife, or like threatening the audience? Like, what does that achieve? <clears throat> does it shock you out of your own skin? Does it shock you out of being passive? I think, yeah, yeah, I think it does. So the assumption is the audience is passive. I think so. Yeah, that's, uh, that's I think a lot of a lot of like well, theater, a lot of art, a lot of art uh, engagements are pretty, pretty much based off of an audience being passive. You know, these are passive receivers. So 
instead of being an active participant, like say, like say with relational studies might draw people into being or active, actively involved in work itself, but uh, I think a lot of the traditional arts have been based off just people being viewers rather than actors, mm -hmm. or, or having, you know, or people are being uh, act, uh, active, passive viewers. Yeah, I think in that way, the artist is like looking for the viewer to have, to act and not just like respond like visually to it. Can you think of another work that might? Like the Francis Elise video of him carrying a gun through Mexico City. I think that put, like him just walking around with a gun exposed really puts pressure on society. Like how, how quick it, are like people going to call the cops, and how how fast are the cops going to get there? And I think, yeah, it, it it really sort of the artist is like passing the responsibility onto either the viewer or like the larger community. Um, walking along a Richard Serra that for the first time his early works, the big sheets. I don't know if I had read before or after where some install installers actually uh, were injured and not killed. Oh. Yeah, one, yeah one, one guy was killed right. at the and walker. And it didn't surprise me. Yeah. So when I went to the show, it was probably in New York. I'm talking about years ago, probably 10, 15 years ago at least. I still remember walking alongside of it. Could I just be the one when this thing just decides to... Tip over. No, yeah. And so, can you describe what that looks like, that piece, walking the line? It's, it's the long, big sheets of steel, and we're talking about half the size of this room, right. almost to the ceiling. Uh, major feats of manufacturing, uh, like a foundry. It's mind-boggling. And then to have the pitch, where these were just enough curve, where they just supported themselves right. and didn't fall over. Right. But literally, um, literally, if someone had pushed it... You... No? See, now that's, I'm, getting, I'm getting the shiver because that's what you didn't want to, to Of course, right, but you knew. I don't think someone could have pushed it. Right. I think maybe if a three linebackers maybe run really hard <laughs> and hit it, it yeah. they might make it wobble. But when you're walking along it, you, I felt minimized and, there's that other, and excited at the same time. Yeah, and those other similar works that are like a T, like where there's just a slab leaning mm -hmm. in a corner and then another slab on top and it's just this right. thing is connected or welded together. Exactly. He sort of took it past where Noguchi did the forms involving nature and the celebration of working with the stone, mostly, or marble. But I'd say those were more balanced and composed. I never was threatened by, let's say, a Noguchi sculpture. Sarah, for sure. So then, I mean, when you saw the show in New York, you already knew this history that someone had been crushed. I can't remember. Yeah. I but can't I remember. I, I don't think I... I'll be honest. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, I think I read it after. after. They were already being celebrated. Yeah. Without question. I mean, when they, they were first known to the public, they were just so dramatic and so brilliant. Um, I but think it was after. Do you think that changed your perception then? Of, um, or you you already felt it beforehand, and now that it was then say validated that okay, this thing actually is dangerous. I might yeah. get. I might have just built an inner rage that how can someone be so? Now, in other words. Here you are, an artist, so you have to take ownership of that you're, we're all walking the same line, and just like, apparently, I apologize, I didn't see this bow, but it sounds fascinating. Um, that, first of all, you're part of the member, you're a member of this team, and then, oh my gosh, someone created something, and of course did not want this to happen, but it did. Right. And... Where was the mistake made? I mean, I'm sure his intention was not there, but it happened. It could be, for instance, an artist using a bunch of chemicals or burning things, whereas I've been reprimanded where I point that path. And a friend of mine says, do you realize what you working with this material and plastics and your burning is doing to the, to the atmosphere, what it's mm -hmm. releasing? 
And um, for that very reason, I stopped doing it. Um, that was just me. Um, well, in that Richard Serra case, they, they found the manufacturer to be at fault. Okay. Yeah, where they did something wrong. As, like, where the pieces met together, um, they did a, a cost-cutting... Okay. Uh, oh, you're kidding me. Yeah. So that they ended up having to pay the, the widow a good sum of money. So as an artist, that, that feels good. So the team member did his due diligence. Yeah. And then, of course, he released it to the fabricating, and they goofed big time. But that's, that's a lesson to be learned, <laughs> as much as you want to cook. And here you're telling us that something, there's a pole on a spring that's anywhere from 8 to 50-something thousand pounds. And you're giggling. I, ju <laughs> I just, I think that's like really scary just hearing it's about that. a crossbow. I mean, it even looks like a handheld crossbow. Is going Those scare me. <laughs> the arrows, the arrows, the arrows yeah, scare me. That like suspension of disbelief, like you're kind of tapping into that whole like idea of theater, you know, you're like, well, shit, if it's within this institution of like Dela yeah. Cruz or something, like, well, like, you yeah. can't like die. It must you be know, like, you know, like, <laughs> just, like, you know, there's this theatrical nature. I think of art, like, it's always like there's that like distancing that, you know, like, even while you're like participating, like, you're kind of still like, I don't know, it, it's still like within this space that like, Safe or something. I don't know. I but is that, a, is that a threshold that's interesting to push, do you think? We're sure. taking people out of their comfort zone and making them make their own decisions of how. Yeah, I think as long as it's like, you can, you can somehow think about it in a productive, like, generative way, then of course, yeah. And it's just if it's, if it's not like for the sake of being. Some people will do and some people don't. Right. And so that's, I think, the, the question for me. Uh, who would be more inclined to do that? Because we're talking about the artist trying to get the audience to be active, as you were saying. Okay. And I think that sometimes that happens and we don't know that the uh, audience is participating. Me as an observer of art could very much walk away very disturbed and very uh, curious or very perplexed uh, with the piece and participate in ways in which the artist does not know that I'm participating. So that we cannot assume that because we're willing to do something uh, that is risky, that we're, we're then participating, that the other is not really participating. But more importantly, I think, is who would be prone to take a risk of that nature knowing that, and I think that's a psychological issue now. Mm -hmm. I must disclose, I'm, I'm a photographer, but I'm a psychologist. And so that there is where the question for me lies, and who would be willing to take the risk? So it's not simply that you go there, but those who go to see the art, some will walk away and some will not participate. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a function of the personality of who the person is. I and mean, it's not necessarily the function of the, of the art piece itself. I mean, it may excite somebody and may push them a little bit forward towards maybe taking a risk that the person already might have been contemplating. But, the, you know, for, for instance, the, the pilots in, during the Japanese war that actually sacrificed themselves, as we observe, we know now that they had a specific type of personalities that you know, make them prone to being able to take those kinds of missions and to do those kinds of things. Uh, usually you will find um, a lot of kind of uh, self-destructive uh, behaviors or antisocial, willing to push the limits and those sorts of things. Um, I'm not saying, I'm not claiming that people are antisocial because they will, you know, they're going to take this kind of uh, risk, but I'm saying there's something that pushes them there's an edge to the personality that the majority of us tend to be conservative and more safe. Um, artists themselves, I think, take risks uh, in terms of pushing, particularly in the unconscious. I mean, it's my belief or my understanding that uh, many artists um, have to visit the dark, have to visit the dangers. They have to be in touch with that. 
you have to be in touch with the shadow, with what's, uh, you know, all these very dark uh, aspects of being a human being. And I think that in some ways maybe we try to convey that uh, to the audience and have them, you know, participate with us in that, in that journey of um, growing deep. No, I think there was a recent example a couple years ago at the museum was Arts and Color. They built this slide going through the several floors of the museum. And it was interesting to see everyone decide these waivers that just wanted to do this really bad. There's this aspect of you know, just this loss of control. You don't know what's going to more or less know what's going to happen, but you know, going down the slide through several floors is scary. And it was interesting to see, you know, some people, they were scared for their safety, but some people were scared, like, oh, how am I going to come out the other end? Am I going to start crying? Or, you know. hmm. But I think, you know, a lot of people signed up for that. There were other things that were like, oh, um, isolation things. But they made it pretty safe. They made you wear a helmet, right? And they just had a waiver. For some of them, yeah. I don't know about the slide. For the slide, I think you had to wear the helmet. But that becomes interesting, though, because the slide becomes the experience in which, you know, how you experience the art. Experience that it also feels like going to Disneyland a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that too. It didn't feel very damp. Like, I went down that little slide too, and I was like, whee! You know, it just like, wasn't scary at all. But I think it opens up this like, whole new spectrum of, you know, sort of the movement of the viewer. You know, I'm moving the viewer from this point to this point, at this speed, at this incline, and the experience of that is a piece. So that opens up like, a whole new spectrum. What's the difference between that and, let's say, the audience going to a concert and expecting to see violence there at the concert? Or in the mosque. Right, so what, is, that, is, that the, is it similar? Is it different? How is it different? I think the slide was extremely calculated where, where the mosque might be. Sort of More of a, a gamble? Or? The variable, like okay, oh, not the slide. I mean, the the discussion and yeah, but like the I guess the general feeling of like participation and okay, I'm going to go to this concert that I know is rough and there's a possibility I'm going to get a black eye or get trampled or like go running with the bulls or something like that. Why do you right? Um, but that's that's kind of the thing that I'm interested in is like all those things create like memorable memories, like those are things that you don't forget and are burned into your brain, like more so than like, oh, maybe okay, I looked at this painting or oh, I watched this video and like it doesn't really get burned in, like these things that you feel and like the fear I think is a, is a good memory trigger where it comes back like as well as smell or something like that where it's like, as soon as you smell that smell again, bam, you're back into that same space. Smell is incredibly powerful. Let me ask you something. But what is it that you're trying to convey? What is it that you want the audience to know? Because I think that's important. Do you want the audience to feel fear uh, and remember what it was like to be afraid? Is that, is that the I, message? Or? I'm just trying to, de trying to figure out um, if this is like a valid way of expressing concepts. Like, Beyond just saying on, on a visual level, if we can go and have like this experiential level, and is that as valid as just being visual? Neurologically speaking, if, if you know, if there, if there are some individuals that are more reactive and some individuals that are more responsive. So you're going to have, in terms of how the autonomic nervous system works, some people will be more responsive and will be more thoughtful of the process. And some people will be very reactive, but they don't you know what they're going to experience is just the fear itself. They're going to remember that uh, more than anything else. Um, and you see it in, in, in people's behavior sometimes. Some people are more. Right, but I mean, we could get that with when you're looking at a painting also. Some people are going to take it in, and some people are just going to go, like, oh, I like the blue there. See, the amygdala, you know probably what it is. The amygdala is, a, is, a, the amygdala is, a part, is an organ in the brain. It's this tiny little gland that controls emotions. And it's responsible for all sorts of emotions, rage, anger. Um, and, mem and, and that memory that you're trying to create is based on the reaction of the I don't know, nervous system and how the amygdala responds to fear. Uh, and so, yes, of course, you're going to have 
very strong memories mm -hmm. recorded when you scare someone. It, it, it's not going to be forgotten. And in fact, uh, the, the question the question is more so. Okay, yes, this, this is this process, but is it um, like we were saying with Mike? Like, is it is um, shooting yourself in the arm or shooting something else that's like loud and frightening or creating an environment that feels unsafe? Are those tactics in contemporary art interesting or useful tactics to convey ideas and concepts? That's the question. Would you say that your pieces would change if you were to have the participants sign waivers? Because I feel that the fact that we don't um, make it required for them to sign waiver makes the piece you know, sort of what it is or what it is. It's a technicality. I think nowadays, like, the, the waiver is kind of bullshit. Like, everyone knows what a waiver is. They sign it aimlessly. If you, you can still sue with the waiver anyway. Um, like, the show Richard was talking about, we did this, it was called the Youth Fair Bro, where we had a, a functional Gravitron. And we actually wrote a waiver out on the wall and had everyone have their picture taken next to it. Um, which was also kind of like, a play on you, meet, you must be this tall to ride this ride, um, and then also the the picture when you're on the roller coaster and you're making the funny face. So like I have, and then now I have a log of all the people that actually came to the show and participated in it. Um, and actually, I ran that past a lawyer, and they were like, "That actually would probably hold up better than a, a signed waiver because a signed waiver, if it's not actually notarized, it's like you could just." That wasn't me. That's not me. I don't. I never signed anything. Um, so I mean, I don't know. Whatever. I don't, I don't think the the legal aspect. I don't think really matters anymore. I don't. I, I kind of disagree. I mean, I totally get where you're coming from. It's like we always sign things, and it's like we don't even read the fine print. We just like say okay. But I think in the context of a gallery or like a an you know an art in, institution. I think it would kind of be jarring and make you think like, oh wait, this could be dangerous. You know, even though like legally it wouldn't mean much of anything, I think it would it would change the tone and make you like think like, well, what am I about to enter into? Right, which you should uh, be on top of that just in like the but care <laughs> for your own life anyway. But, but I think people don't, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not thinking about you know the, the rock climbing dildos. Yeah. It's just like it's so odd that I'm not thinking about. Well, that was a dangerous. that was a funny one, which a lot of people took liberties with the craftsmanship and decided to, that they wanted to like climb to the top of it and hang by one hand off the dildo and swing around like a monkey. And like you've watched a bunch of them break off, and okay, you're still gonna try that and it's concrete floor and I, I felt like I had to stand beneath that to catch people because they and we made the mistake of serving whiskey and rum and people proceeded to get really drunk and then we had a handful of dangerous obstacles that was like okay people are hitting their heads or almost falling off the side of the slide and they're getting crazy on the rock climbing wall. It was like, after about 10 o'clock, it was like, okay, we have to shut this down because... Like, I, I made all this stuff for you to have fun and have, like, this memorable experience, but now you're taking advantage of me. And you've, you're not caring for your own life, and now why do I have to, like, overstep my boundary to, to care for your life? When you say we, how many people are you talking to? Um, that participated in the creation of this work? That particular show, I think there was five or six involved. I just find it kind of hard to believe that if you knew you were serving whiskey or whatever, that not one of you was giggling in the back of your head about what can really happen with this. Um, well, I mean, it's expanded. We, we've we've, we've, just, we've all just, grown I, with I, like I, making I, our... I'm, our not, I'm not trying to talk my, about it or anything, but I just... I don't think that would have anything to do with it, knowing the local community. It's just like it's, people got be that way anyway, so it's not like, it's not like it's, you're introducing it something sounds to like, make people drink whiskey or... Like wine, or whiskey, whatever. and whatever, instead of white wine. Um, 
on that circumstance, it was just what we what was provided for free to us. So I had a donation of two giant bottles of rum and two giant bottles of whiskey. Um, and then, re- yeah, kind of realized that this is this was a bad idea. I almost see a great mate to the. I didn't see it, but just the concept. I kind of see that. So it got a little bit out of. Hand. I, I felt like it got a little bit out of hand. Like I sobered up quite quickly, and um, yeah, for a good reason. <laughs> Responsible for the other, you the artist, and the other has to make a decision. But the potential for serious drama mm-hmm. is there. Yeah. You understand? You never know what's going right. to happen. And drama, 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 not drama, drama. Because I got done. Because, because they, 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 they are, 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 something that I think might be of value in understanding the human mind and what you're trying to achieve with the, your proposal of using, you know, exciting kinds of pieces of work and dangerous kind of pieces of work. Because you could have somebody uh, flip out. Right, well, say we push it to this new level where I make a new show and we kill six people in the opening. And then throughout the course of the rest of the show, like four more people die. Wow. And we got to that level. We've killed ten people. No waivers. And no waivers. I'm at fault. <laughs> but everyone else was well aware this was dangerous. You came in, you you experienced it, you saw everything I've done before this, you knew what to expect, you came in and you went for it. So then what? Now where are we at? Like can we push well, that I even further? So. Do we want to kill more people? Or do we... Is it contrary? Kill or not killing, but it's kill or die. Like, like, what you're talking about, I'm kind of like, it's like mm-hmm. almost, I'm going to say something that's on the On the contrary. So, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. so let me say it, and then you can like, <laughs> but, um, uh, but no, it's like, you're almost like, getting like, closer to the sublime. When I say that. You know? Or no, <laughs> it's like, it's not, that's a good thing. Because we're talking about, we're going to say that because you're like, it's oh. fine, no one else has dropped the sublime. Yeah. But that's what you it's really like, want is you want to be walking that like razor's edge of or like that aspiration you know of like doing that although constant you can't do it but you know like yeah know, like trying to get to the sublime through art you know like that seems like oh shit like yeah maybe it's through drama or something yeah. but that's exactly how you change the passive audience to being an active audience that's how you reinstill agency back into the spectators that's what I like a lot of this other kind of share this art with uh, people, but it's that has to do with like kind of reinventing or, or contemporizing the romantic back into the arts. It's like it, it makes people, you know, like through danger kind of like able better maybe, maybe better able to deal with the dangers of living in the real world. You know, it's like that's a great good yeah. so that's, that's, that's what that's, which, that's what oh, that's the potential of kind of re-romanticizing the arts. Body, the really good body validation, right? That in there. So it's, it's, so that, that's what the danger thing does. I mean, you, you take the danger. You, 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 everybody who's, who thinks anticipates the danger. You know, I, when I like just to use the, that that same piece, uh, the spinning piece, for instance. It's like, okay, I, I I knew it could fail, so I said, well, if it fails, how am I going to hang on and survive? You know, so I think that's pretty much. It's a, right. It's sort of like an allegory for life. You know, how do you anticipate violence or trauma or drama or whatever and survive it? So I, I think a lot of art it, it, it has that power to do that, to kind of 
to kind of create that parallel between art and real life. But there's a difference because there's a difference being that like art has a tendency to aestheticize things, which kind of makes it a little bit more easy to deal with rather than just like pranks. What, what's the you know, pranks can do the same thing, but what makes a prank different than an art project? You know, like what makes him a, a, what's his name shooting himself in the arm different than some other like crazy prank? You know. Because well, there was like that that story, like what was it like maybe ten years ago? Not the UCLA grad student who did like the like one Chris it was the whole thing that Chris Burton retired over because the student like well, I don't know maybe you know he, I I, I, I looked at it a little bit, but uh yeah basically his student was gonna redo the shooting and it was like went into the hallway and then there was like a gunfire went off or like a sound of a gunfire and everyone thought like this dude just shot himself or something but yeah. then like you know like everyone freaked the fuck which out which turns obviously. that wonderful you know, Chris Burton thing into a commodified relationship you know the whole, the whole situation thing the whole situation thing about kind of recuperating some things that have already happened in terms of turning them into sort of a commodified relationship where they become repetitious you know so to reshoot yourself in the arm is kind of like a stupid gesture because well, there's another reenactment which is uh, like Jeremy Deller's piece of the Battle of Ograve, which yeah. is like a miners' strike that happened in 1984 in in Ireland so. or in Scotland, and um, essentially like there was a he did it in I think 2004. Um, basically, it was like a movie set where he cast all these characters and staged this reenactment of this really bloody, uh, violent uh, clash between police and miners on a strike and um, I mean that piece involved people hurting themselves and hurting each other and um, I mean that of course that's different than reenacting like Chris Burden's shoot but I mean there's like there's a, a certain um, willingness to cause bodily harm and or dangerous situations for the point of something for an audience well not even for an audience for an just audience. for the for the piece like for the sake of the piece right. um, the audience you know, wasn't there was no audience there. There was zero. I mean, of course, like it went on and on and on um, in, in um, film and video. So but it's a theater without spectators. Yeah, but the, I'm just like I guess I'm not sure what the point is. But the, there's deliberate use of um, of dangerous technique to, and in a way, it, like with like with Chris Burton, it almost feels like a or when people die uh, for artworks, it's almost like a kind of weird martyrdom where it's like, well, okay, well, let's take this idea really seriously. Like, this, like, I mean, and it's, this isn't what I mean to say, but, like, is it possible that someone might die for art and and does that make that idea that they died for more important or does it make it more frivolous or, you know, what? Or are you just trying to one-up somebody, you know, because that's, that's... Well, I highly doubt that, you know? Yeah, I yeah. highly, highly yeah. doubt that someone's I mean, that's what, that, But I think that's what a lot of, like, What's the, what's the movie series where the guys are always doing crazy things that hurt each other? Like, Jackass. Uh, Jackass. Yeah, I mean, it's always trying to one up some the, okay. next, the last thing, but it's still. Uh -huh. but, it, but, it, but does it serve a social end? I mean, no, does it, no. is it is it is it is the intention to like help people deal with living better? You know, I don't know. Well, sure, but that's actually like kind of an interesting parallel, yeah, Jackass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's because. But like, what's at stake? What's at stake with Jackass? Like hubris, egos. What's at stake with Chris Burton shooting his arm? Like, because they, they inspire a lot of people to go in their backyards and do like mock, mocking, mocking. Right, but like, the, there's different things at stake, right. and yeah, uh, that that's something. I just think it's human nature. We're just gonna keep pushing, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Fine, it's, so. it's inevitable. Well, I think you go with teleological concerns or intent. I mean, I don't think art, Chris Burden, was really intending for people to one up him. See, I don't think he was really trying to, like, say, okay, I shot myself in the arm, someone else can shoot himself in the screen. Or, like, or, he was yeah. trying to one up himself during that time. He had, like, a whole series that year of all these dangerous works yeah. where he's, like, on the ladder above the electrified water. Yeah, yeah a bunch yeah. of stuff. Right, and then the, the elevator where you could come in and do whatever you wanted to him. Um, What's that one all about? Was that him or is that? I don't know. Maybe. Um, he was crucified on the back of the Volkswagen. And they like took two like electrical, I don't even know what you would call them, like the two clamps or something like hooked in his chest. 
I know, I think it was like a Marina Abramovic where she was oh, like... Well, yeah, when she was on the table and she had all these objects out right. and people could basically do whatever they wanted with the objects to her laying on the table. And I know there was a gun. And so it also implicated the, the person that you were to come up and be like, I'm, I can hurt this person if I want. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I know people probably thought it was funny to like hold a gun up to her head or whatever, but like, I mean... I can't imagine how she felt about that. Well, maybe we can. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But she, you know, she did those. She, she created that scenario for deliberate purpose. Oh so yeah. What is that purpose? Is the question. I think it was for her to. Yeah. Again, going back to what Michael said about this, like this urge to feel something. You know, if if someone's range of emotions is normally like in this set of brackets like to feel something really extreme well do you think that like society now is already past like the old norms of art and then to like make stuff valid for this new population of people that that's where art has to go where it's like now I mean I definitely think we've we've gotten comfortable and used to a lot of things but I think there will always be things out of our range that we don't normally experience. I do feel like we we have become numb or used to a lot, but I think there's gonna always be like ways to push it further. Maybe more specific. Well, I mean, like think of in well, like Marina Abramovich, for example. I feel like when she was first doing those performances, I mean, just seeing a couple naked and like slapping each other on the face or something would be really shocking. I mean, the nudity was shocking. The the physical violence that but they were shocking to who? To the audience? Yeah, to like the larger society. Yeah. Well, before her, like, you were like eating lunch. I mean, like, yeah. She was like totally like one of the precursors of that. Like, What's the piece? Yeah. Lydia lunch. She's this performance artist. I don't know. Oh, like, what's the piece? You name it, to get it to her body. I'm not telling you to name it, <laughs> I mean, sticking things in her vagina in front of the crowd and just, you know, like, you know pushing out ping pong balls. You mean Carolee Schneeman? Huh? No. Carolee no. Schneeman? She was from Maine. She was back in the 60s, 70s. Huh? But like, but Carolee Schneeman is a really good example with I, I forgot what the piece is called. But basically, where she you know pulls a scroll out of her vagina and reads it. Okay, there you go. Um, <laughs> and, and like that what's it? scroll, scroll, and she reads this poem or whatever. But I think the biggest, the big point of, of all these performances is that it's 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 towards an art crowd. So like like but the normal crowd is like the rest of society, which is like not even there yet, you know. It's like so it doesn't take much to shock the rest of society, but it might take more to shock an art crowd, you know. So yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, but how about a county fair? I mean, that's that's yeah. You don't definitely like, literally let's just won't show up there for sure. I mean, or, 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 you know, just because that's just or if she did, she would do whatever she did, you know. But I think there's a certain there's certain social taboos that exist in different social strata and different social levels. That part of like normal things like county fairs or whatever. In the art gallery, the art institution is a whole different ballgame. Yeah. yeah, I definitely agree with you because like thinking back when Marina had her retrospective at MoMA and she had younger performance artists like kind of reenacting earlier things she had done, you know, on the it was like a news story just, you know, for the broader audience like they're going to be these naked young people at MoMA, but like for the people who were familiar and like in the art community, like I don't think anyone was surprised or yeah, yeah. thought it was remotely shocking. Yeah, or even something as simple as like Piss Christ back in those days. Yeah. It was like visually, it was just a visual piece. It wasn't really threatening anybody. It was just, it was about something, but, but it was interpreted totally different by mainstream, mainstream, mainstream religious zealots who took it as offensive against Well, this everybody. is like the culture wars, but I think yeah, we yeah. might be getting yeah. off topic. But it's still, no, I don't think so, because I think a lot of... A I mean, I was just censored during Basel for making a religious, um, I don't know, what, slandering. Oh, by, right, right. 
by spray painting "fuck the Pope" on the side of a boat and putting it in the pool yeah, at a yeah. hotel. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of violence that happens physically that you can take in, but there's also a lot of visual violence, visual rhetoric that can be violent too. That's still very that can be violent to some people because it's, 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 it's still like throwing things at people. Even though you're not shooting a two by four, you're still shooting images at people. So it still has a similar power, I and mean, maybe not the same power because you're not you're not hitting a biomass, but you're still hitting. I people. think it's much more like individual though, and like yeah, yeah. But it's more of a collective individual rather than just individual. So. Mr. Tony. I think the difference is that something like your crossbow is a functional piece, and if it's shooting something or not, it looks cool. Um, you know what I mean? So I think that kind of is, is a little bit of credit. You know, your whole youth hero show, just looking at the show, where regardless if you got the thing or you got the push on the card and you fell or whatever, eating from your stand was sketchy. Well, like, but so tell, me, scared, tell me, so that funny. month of the Art Walk, do you remember any other show? Well, we don't really, I don't know, I don't pay attention to a lot of things. Um, you know, just because there's so much going on that I'm seeing, you can walk by, and you don't know what you're seeing. You know, but like, that was, so. I mean, our whole point of putting that show on was mm -hmm. to make this, like, overly memorable show. Right, of course. And but. it seems like... It burned into everyone's brain, and like I, like we were super worried after that. Like, how can we ever do this better? Because, like, we hit on all the tropes. We had the smells from from the youth fair. We had this like danger and like fun and the feelings, and the look and the touch. And it's like, okay, we actually did it. Like this but was like an. Ex Yeah. You know what I mean? Like one guy sitting here tells me like, all kinds of chaos and seems just flying. Like that doesn't make sense. Like I don't know what it takes to build something like that. Yeah, I mean an exhibition is a whole other thing. Like I mean the exhibition is things like they can care less who's watching. You know what I mean? Like I don't think that exhibition cares who's watching or not. Um you know, watch this. That's a response from the magician, you know what I mean? Like it is sketchy to a show, like you know you're gonna go to a place and it's just gonna be a zoo. You know, I mean, like people do expect that. So, like, you, you have that adrenaline pumping on the way there. I don't even have to be at a show, I know it's going to be crazy. You know what I mean? So, you have it already. You know what I mean? Like, so you have it. But then, so how do we compare that then to, say, a show of abstract painting? And how do we, like, can we look at them at the, as the same level? Um, or there's, there's I don't think different you can. rubrics? Yeah, I don't think you can. I think that it's not. I mean, if you want to you guys, if you want to answer, that's what you can. I don't think so. I think it's, it's those are completely different plans. But that, I mean, that's where my concern has gone. Where like, how can I elevate this experiential level to the same as, say, like a top tier painting show? And like, how can we get like that same respect for the experience? Like you know, like I, I'm just trying to. Yeah. Think, like they're, they're they're I mean, one they're they're totally different. Like maybe like psychological spaces to be in, but also like, I don't know, like that rubric that it was made under was like within kind of like the previous how many years of painting, right? Or like, I'm sure or like maybe okay. some sort of like kind of philosophical thought, whereas like yours, I mean, I feel like I'm not trying to like poo poo it, or, but I just feel like it's like much more engaged with kind of like a populist approach or something like, like you just said, like we want it to be memorable and fun, you know, but it's like right. not like Oh, man, I, I gotta do a representational painting, or something, you know. So like, it's just, like different, you know. And, like that's neither good nor bad. It's just kind of like you know, like I don't know, like can you compare with the Barnum and Newman? Like I, they're just or, like I don't think so. They're just different. You know? I don't think you should try not to do yourself. You know, I mean, I think that'd be great to kind of or or concern yourself with it. I, I keep listening and thinking and thinking, and uh, I think I know the show that you're talking about. Um, it just seems like a little blip on the radar that's just part of your process and it 
directly and indirectly, it's all part of our process. In other words, there's a lot of this careers and aspirations, there's a lot of this. And all of a sudden, with that madness, that's just my take on it, you level things out. It's almost as if you just wipe the canvas clean. And now you're about to go on your way again. So again, for the whole reinventing, it's just a natural process that just occurred, and you shared it, and here we are talking about it. And I almost feel that there's a sense that it just, it's sort of like, I guess what you get from a yoga class or something like that, or some form of med med uh, meditation. It just cleaned everything out, so now you're just on your way again, instead of the overthinking. It's just all over again, just Habits, yeah, yeah. As simple and as mundane as that might sound, that, that's kind of where I'm taking it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think what what may be going, what goes on with this general topic is about how best to be offensive to the context or the history of the culture that you live in. You know, it's like, like a lot of a lot of what a lot of how a lot of people may encounter your work is that it's offensive. Offensive in the sense that it's not a painting or a sculpture, or or it's like totally out of the bounds of like maybe the conservative mindset of what art should be. So I think historically speaking, you can look at all kinds of periods, decades, and in the sense of what offends the general public the most <laughs> or the least. You know, so like, I mean, I think back to the Bakuni thing. I think back in the 40s, you know, painting monstrous women was very offensive. It could have been just as strikingly. A, Disturbing, yeah. Disturbing. Disturbing. So, what's the function of yeah. disturbing yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, what it is has that? a lot to do with what time you live in. You know, like, it's like, I mean, like your work, your piece could could work very well in the 18th century, you know, because it's not really offensive. It just scares people. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, what I'm saying, so it's not it's not necessarily contemporary in the sense that it's pushing buttons against us, except that it's that it's still pushing people from being. Still trying to make people not be passive. You know? I still think it's more of an instrument for that. It's, it plays more of an instrumental role in to make people less passive, which could, which is kind of like almost a timeless thing. The same piece would work in the 1800s, 1900s, 20th century, 21st century, whatever. Whereas a decuning painting wouldn't necessarily. It only works to offend people in that day, you know, against what people think painting should be. So there's a different. Like so what is that function? Context, what is the function of that transgressiveness? I think it, it just relates to the time we live in. You know, it's like what works for but us. But if it doesn't relate to the time we live in, like if it doesn't, like it has nothing to do with the time we live in, but it's like that tool that helps you to offend or disrupt the status quo, or that's what you just said. Right, but is that? I guess. But that's what you. That's that's the definition, isn't it? Kind is of. That your it, it, it disrupts the status quo. Isn't that the answer? It's like it's almost a rhetorical question. I guess I just want to push it a little bit further yeah, no, as, I'm a, not, as a I'm tactic. Not, I'm not sure exactly the, the question or the other. I'm not sure the question. Is like the but tactic the of involved. deliberately distressing or pushing people to a boundary, what does that achieve? Oh, 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 yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, hopefully something good. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> torture devices. I, so I, 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 think, I, think, I think ultimately you're, 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 what's the purpose, what's the purpose of art? Does, it, does art really have a purpose? Does it have a, is that kind of like, if I just seem to Yeah, let's get out of that. Because yeah, that, that, that gets into like, to be a deep of a comment. I'm safe. What were you going to say, Mike? I mean, I've said this probably before, so it's not like this. But, uh, I mean, it's, you know, kind of like the difference between the illustrative and the demonstrative and that, like, you know, like, this is, like, the actual thing, right? Whereas, like, maybe the cooning, like, is this representation of, like, violence or something, whereas, like, these things, like, are experiential, right? Like, I thought of that. I don't know. Something that Amanda said made me think of, like, the Santiago Sierra piece where, like, um, like, maybe where he took a semi-truck or hired someone to drive a semi-truck into the middle of Mexico City during rush hour and then just kind of, like, back it in so all lanes of traffic were blocked and kids they just sat there for five minutes and then after that, you know, and then was able to like drive off, you know, but like there's like this really kind of like transgressive thing. We're like in a way it's like not yeah, you're not like talking about politics, it is politics, it is a political 
It is a disruption in yeah. reality. Yeah, it which functions. like that, and then I think that's like maybe the most effective work that can be done. You know, like I mean, I really like his work because he has to be the asshole. Like he can't, you know, like he can't yeah. critique it without becoming a part of the problem. That's not your work. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I feel like that's where I get led into. Where it's like, oh, you have to be the asshole, and like, yeah. then is that what I have to do? Is that then push those boundaries? Are you really though? In, when all said and done, and history just moves on, are you really the asshole? Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, or are you the savior? Because that's kind of like how I look at it. I think you could look at our, all artists, all powerful artists, being kind of like an intervention. So, so it just kind of relates to, to like your, your 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 pieces happen to be an intervention in Miami's you know world of time. You know, it's, 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 uh, art, art as intervention, it's whether it's social intervention or, or whatever, it does something. It does something to make people maybe get out of their past, get off get off their ass, and like get more invigorated and do something else. So there is a purpose, I think, for intervention. All right. Well, spur let's else. let's get away from my stuff. That's my fault. I'm sorry. And so, but like, it's, it's an easy so, example. Say you're gonna take a trip to New York, and you're looking for shows. It's like, are you going to look for something like that to go experience? Are you gonna say like, hey, what's going on at the at like uh, what is it like the Upper East Side Armory building? Like those big. Um, what was the one? The Ann, was it Ann Hamilton? Oh, yeah, the 67th Street Armory. 67th Street Armory. That puts on big, crazy. I, think people just, like, I mean, like, obviously, it's not going to appeal to everyone. Uh, but, like, you know, what's that? When it was, like, Bad Boys in the early 2000s, the, like, Nate Lohman. Like, he did the, the drawings with the motorcycles. It just became this huge. Like, oh, no, that was the other guy. It wasn't Lohman. It wasn't Seth Price. Aaron Young. Aaron Young, right. Yeah. <laughs> Where it was just, like, you know, the whole entire place was just, like, black plywood and there's like all dudes out there. Second, like, you know, and just like make these crazy drawings, but like, you know, there's like reports and like all these crazy, you know, yeah, that like that, that were, it, like, it made it way out of the like, art world, yeah, yeah, like this, like, huge, like, ridiculous theatrical events, like, make these drawings, you know, like, but like, it was extremely heavily attended because, like, I mean, I don't know, if it, you know, necessarily because it's like there's some fear or something, but like, there is this kind of like, this is. Or I, don't, I don't know what, like, why everyone, why everyone was talking about that thing. The NASCAR like, mentality of, like, let's... Yeah, right, like, it, it, and, like, the, it's really and... kind of, like, parallels to art fairs, right? Like, you know, like, rarely do you see events like these happen, like, the other months of the year, but always when, like, art fairs come around, it's, like, the times of, like, let's have a crazy project. Like, and I don't really know what that is, because it's, like, yeah. maybe, like, the only, like, non commodifiable like, Or, like, at the you know? Venice Biennial, like, who gets written up as like the, the country that provides the biggest spectacle. Or... Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say it. I think it has to do with spectacle. I mean, I can't remember the artist's name, but um, he he does like the drawings with gunpowder. So he basically like lights up all these fireworks and has these sort of spectacle. Yeah, and I mean, people. I think people get excited when there's. A dramatic event like when there's fire or like motorcycles it's just that kind of exhilaration in the cars yeah, it's like how are you gonna write about like there's um, another paintings are looking dope or so that's like, can, you know, like <laughs> right. but like jerry salts wrote an article after the carson holler show it was just like museums are so stupid by well, putting what's the function of a museum a, a museum is stupid very popular. Yeah. Yeah. So he was like tearing it apart. It was like we're dumbing down the art world for these experiential things where like people want to come to the museum just because there's a slide. But if a museum like wasn't heavily dependent upon like these kind of like other sources of funding or you know what I mean? Like they, they museums are kind of put into that corner probably. You know, like they're just like, oh shit, we need to like get people to us and they we need to be fun. That's why every museum like in the world has just like single Fridays or whatever. You know, it's like it's like kind of like a similar thing, you know. But it's it like, seems like it's like the shitty stepbrother of like the art that they really want to show. It's like 
this is what we want to show, but the rest of the world doesn't want to see this. So every once a mo- one day out of the month, we're going to have the slip and slide, and then yeah. the hillbillies come in right. and say, right. like, right. Oh, right. I mean, like, that's how you increase your cool. audience. Yeah. Well, statistics, that's right. Well, but that's what I'm, I'm trying to, to question is, is the shock value actually valid? Like, do, do we need it? Just said that as a good thing. Well, I, yeah, well, I think yeah, that's okay, the way to do yeah, it. The right yeah, way. I think so. That's what the situation is called deterrent. You know, it's like turn, turn, turn capital back to the head. It's like make, make whatever that thing is that capitalism or, 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 or that capitalized entity do the opposite of what it's meant to do. You know, take an ad and make it sell something else. You'll always have a self-selected group that is going to go and enjoy and participate. And you have to make a decision when you pay. The days of people will not participate. Yeah, but who cares, right? Yeah, okay. it doesn't matter. It does, yeah, it's those people that will want to be there, that will want to participate, that you have a message to convey to, that will enjoy it. Or not the opposite, be scared by it, be shocked by it. You're saying is shock value worthwhile, like, or is it just a tactic? Like, is it a valid, cheaply, or people use a valid properly? trope of art nowadays, or is it dismissed as like, oh, that's just that mm-hmm. spectacle. that spectacle shocking? No, oh, it's still very much you know, going on. You see it uh, constantly. The art fair. Somebody brought that up. And, you know, I read that article. What well, article was? It was uh, during Basel, and it was uh, the spectacle of the art fair. Is that what it, is art becoming that? Well, that's a good question, sure. But um, I think you're going to decide that, right? That the audience and then if enough people don't want to see that, you won't see that kind of art anymore. You don't see much large scale photography you know, like you did in the early 2000s. Maybe you'll see you know, less of this as we go on. You know, maybe next year we'll be a little toned back from that, or five years, or maybe it'll be more, but is it always going to go up and down? So your point is that it doesn't matter? <laughs> no, like, you'll decide if it matters or not. I don't know if it matters. Well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I... Some, some of them, you know, I respond to, and others I don't, and it's okay, you know. I think a lot. One, one, one answer to that question is, is that shock value tends to like make people respond authentically to certain given situations. So, so uh, you know, a lot of what uh, a lot of what art does, or theater, or performances do, it just kind of maintains some sort of status quo. It represents certain ways of being that people just like, oh yes, I see that they're suffering, it's a commodified thing, I know about that, but that keeps that thing suffering. Whereas when you're, like a lot of times shock value, it forces people out of these sort of normal ways of viewing things. It, it makes people cope with unique ways of like responding back to that. Like I can imagine seeing that Chris Burton shooting himself in the arm, arm back in that day, actually being there would have been like, I mean, the people in that room must have just been like horrified, you know, and just to, just to, just because they were they were in a unique position to see something that didn't exist before, that never happened before. So the reaction to that, if shock value event, really created a different way of dealing with that situation. But like, so say that Chris Burden piece, like, what do you think those emotions are that are 
are like churned up in each viewer. Like, is, there is fear that like, okay, someone just got shot. Like, well, could we it, get? It's a fear of having to deal with the unknown. I think a lot of times situations like that, like a lot of like a lot of what um, horrific things happen in the world, and people don't know how to cope with them. So, like, I think a lot of times artworks have the power to create situations that people. It, it, it creates situations that are almost analogous to the real world because it teaches people how to cope with uncertainty. So like, like, like even just, sorry to go back to your real thing, but it is like an uncertain situation. Like, I don't, I'm not used to dealing with uncertainty like this, so it helps people deal with that. Right, so I mean, that is like this uneasiness. Yeah. You have no, so that, that's I That's a mean, valuable thing, you know, that's a very valuable but then, thing for art to do. Sounds so simple. But then, like, the shooting piece, then you get maybe some compassion. Like, oh, you feel bad for Burden. Like, oh, his arms broke. No, There's a bullet just, in him, so maybe. Much that. It's just like, it just, it just makes people react outside of their normal, commonplace way of accepting, like, say, the media. Like, say, when, you're, when you watch TV, you almost always know the outcome of whatever narrative that's going to be there. You know, but like you're watching the, the nightly news and it's like, oh, like what do they yeah, try to do? Like, I think that's the thing. Also, think about the piece in like relation to like the Vietnam War. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, was, yeah. Like, Which is you why know, like, it was very me. much like you know that's sure. happening here and like shit like right. this is what's happening here, but like, right. right, you know, so, like, absolutely. Like, like those are like things really important. Uh, but I think uh, the answer basically is that the shock value does have it has a way of helping people deal with coping with the unknown. Which is what an authentic experience is. It's something that you're not used to normally dealing with. Because if it was something you were used to coping with or handling, it wouldn't be an authentic experience. It would just be a normal, everyday drudgery of just coping with how right. to but f- solve this problem. Is like, that's normal. I think why I like the shock value is that it is like an easy jump into these this like emotional state. Mm-hmm. And then you get like the full gamut of emotions that someone can then possess like when okay I'm looking at a sculpture or a painting like what sh- what do you want this person to feel through this experience but it, like when you shock them then it's like all senses are heightened and like oh like I have that fear initially oh now I have this compassion because like oh maybe someone did get hurt and now I feel bad that they did get hurt or like um yeah but if you go back to the sublime or the back to this sort of fear of the unknown to me which is a very powerful thing which is a lot of art over the over the centuries has done you know it's created this that you're trying to control what the other person is going to feel that if you know you're, you're trying to get compassion yeah. out of something i don't know that that's completely possible at all uh, because everybody comes with their own psychic and their own experiences and their own way of looking well, at things i don't think you're trying to control you're just trying to be a catalyst for creating Foundation for people to be but to what extent, sure about what but they to what think extent about. Extent it's like dis- but to what extent that it's really 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 well, there's, there's another term called yeah. estrangement, yeah. estrangement, which is a very much the thing. A lot of times, the estrangement is like when when, when, you, when you put people in a situation where they where it's like where, where they're just where, where they're perceiving the uncanny. This is that's another thing about like ghosting. There's all these things about perceiving things that are scary. Sorry, go back to that. That's to me. That's important. Um, well, just as one thing, like maybe maybe it has something to do with being a, a visitor and, and a viewer of a work, and then also, and then the shift between you become implicated in the situation, you actually start to live the situation in a real way. You contribute to it. You're you're actually starting to live this situation as opposed to just being a spectator of a situation. So I think this this issue of like being implicated in in a, in a lived moment. Um, a very like Alan, very basic Alan Capro kind of approach. I mean, that makes sense to me. But I think as an artist, you have to lead them into the experience in a, in a responsible way. You what? can't be yes, you can't be reckless about it because otherwise you're not achieving the purpose of what you want to, which is the person to really have a, a sense of connecting to your vision of what you're trying to convey. Otherwise, you know, you don't know what's going to happen to. Like what happens with that piece that people recklessly began to do things that you didn't anticipate. Well, there could be there are moments where recklessness is a really one a very productive um, uh, output. 
I think. Uh, it's a wonderful people... ritual. Pardon ritual. me? Ritual experiences are based off that same thing. Creating chaos. To That's what a ritual is all about. Okay. Creating chaos. So that's... And then but from that you learn. As long as you, you consent to it. Well, I guess you wouldn't be there. Unless you yeah, exactly. <laughs> as long as you consent to it. But uh, I hear you're trying to attract audiences that are not just a, the self-selected audience that goes there to, to, to see what uh, is there. But I think what you're talking about, I think a good word for that is that a lot of times what, what, what happens is you're, you're creating a sense of solidarity. So like if you're an audience and you perceive something that's happening on the stage or through an artwork, you gain not a distance between that thing, you're not objectifying that thing, like say, uh, whatever that, whatever that is, but if, if it's some post, you know, post modern sort of thing about, let's say, it relates to prostitutes, you know, like you're, you're not, you're, you're showing this object that's a social relation, but you're not necessarily creating the distance between that. So you, as an audience, when you can gain, when you can hop over that distance and be, sort of gain the solidarity to that object, then that's successful. Well, suddenly it relates to you and yeah, your decision. Yeah, yeah, you're part of it, even though it's not your world. Well, not, not that it relates, but you are directly involved in Yeah, you, being you understand what it is to be that object, or be involved in that, that social situation, whatever. That's like social interaction, yeah. social, social uh, whatever, you know. Social practice is what creates these bridges between people. I'm kind of thinking on a really basic level, of like, what is that um, psychological test where there's... Um, like there are actors on one side of the wall, but the person didn't know it on the other side. It was be like, well, if you push this button, then you're going to electrify this person for mm -hmm. ten seconds. And like, of course, you Mel know, Grom is the is the Mel Grom is the person. Thank you. So that. when you're pushing those buttons, you were like, I don't know why they were motivated to push the buttons, but maybe you know. Yes. Yeah. The study was done to understand what happened in Nazi Germany. Yeah. Uh, and to understand why people would actually do something like that. Even though, I mean, right. and part is the, the sense of trust on the examiners that were indicating that it was not really hurting people. Right, it's not really hurting. And then they would hear on the other side, but it wasn't really hurting them. And, yeah. and that sense of trust. And more recently, they, they've done a study with a um, uh, neurotransmitter uh, called oxytoxin. And why are people willing to trust other people with right. their money? It was a big research done. But the point is they, here is like, why, like, what what happens with these environments where people, some, you know, viewers of artworks or participants of artworks it, are, 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 they, are some, they, they find trust. themselves in a, in a moment where they're implicated in this kind of situation where they're not just a viewer, they're like implicated and they're somewhat at fault. Where there is a contagious and they, they are, you know, they're trusting. It's, a, it's an issue of trust and it's. It has to do with the trust in that what you're being told, that this person who is guiding you, who is doing this experiment, is telling you that that person is not really hurting. And you're choosing to believe it. You're choosing to believe I, it. I disagree. I think it's more to do with risk. Well, the risk is a lot the, more powerful. Read the, read the trust is like, I'm not talking about a study. I'm just talking about me as a person. I'm like, there's certain things that are more interesting to me that involve risk than trust. Like, you know, taking risk is more authentic more of an authentic way of being. So, sorry. sorry. I'm, no, I'm <laughs> sounds good. Taking a risk is more authentic. Yes. Yes. Trust. You, trust. See, that's the problem. You should. Be. <laughs> but, but I think that. that I don't think so. I think you need to make your own decisions, and you don't. You shouldn't trust anything. Oh. That's I trust you to come up with more things. Trust you as being one-on-one -on -one with one of your installations or a performance order, I think that I did, I did, I, there's a separation there. But I'm thinking that's maybe where you're coming from. We trust Justin to keep it going. Okay. That's wrong. Justin, so if you told everybody that if they did this, they were going to die for sure. How many people do you think will get on it? If people do trust the fact that you've tested this, that they're going to go to this experience that is so hard. I know there's somebody out there that's going to do it. There's going to be somebody out there. Well, yeah, there's always going to be another out there that's going to do that. But maybe that's her artwork. Huh? Maybe that's your piece. <laughs> but you can't, you can't, that's not a realistic hypothetical. No, but 
but I, they show the Like, top. just the, the incineration the roller coaster ride. Like, <laughs> here you go. We're going to burn you today. I didn't trust you guys at all. There, there <laughs> are very trust people. I, I have never there. trusted anything you guys did, but I was willing to take a risk that it would work. So to me, that, that's, that's more of like a real take, taking chances. Uh, or different than risk management. Risk management is kind of like almost a similar thing to trusting, but, but, but taking but taking gambles is a whole different. Thing. Well, like that Gravitron, it broke both both showings, the opening and the closing. We and no, well, minor. <laughs> Minorly hurt. One one kid almost flew out of the Gravitron, but he was being. He took upon himself to be the cool kid that would wanted to flip upside down, like you would in the real Gravitron. Um, and he lost his his handhold or whatever, and ended up half flying out and tore the bicycle off the wall. And um, so he was really, he was running risks too. Right, he was, and he he decided like, all right, I saw somebody else do it. I'm going to try this. And yeah, but there's there's a to me there's a certain better value to that way of taking chances like that to me that was just, he was more alive doing that than, than people that were that were just sitting there oh, I trusted you guys to give me a good ride there was mm-hmm. something more authentic about that experience of him being whatever he was, you know? was to me that's I place a value on that so then how do we feel about actually dying for art? Well, we're going to die in places. I don't matter. <laughs> if, I, if I knew I had cancer, if I could die for an art cause, I would. You know, it's like that's, that's the, 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 But I don't think anybody's going to die. Like those crystal umbrellas, you know, one of them fell over and killed somebody. But it wasn't, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't their fault. Yeah, right? It wasn't meant to happen. Yeah, but that's an accident. No? Yeah. That accident. has nothing to do with dying for yeah. art. <laughs> <laughs> That's an accident. That could happen on a street corner people, with a stop sign. Yeah, people that build skyscrapers, steel, the steel workers, you of course. know, that, especially turn of century steel workers, people were dropping my flies, literally, mm-hmm. him, you know, because they were falling off skyscrapers and doing, and they took, they, there was a certain amount of risk, like I'm going to get paid this wage, but I have to risk my life, but I don't think no one wants, it's not suicide, you know. But what about actually suicide, like being an artist and then dying for your art? Hey, I think that's cool. In fact, if you got a good point, if you got a point, a- anyone, el- anyone else? Uh, why not? Uh, one of my, only, the- my only thought is, gosh, <laughs> what, what, it's, so, it's, it's really, it's a fine line. Because I'm thinking, there goes this apparent super talent that he's either fulfilling himself with in his identity. That's what he's going to fulfill and doesn't even care about what he's not going to know, he knows prior. But I'm thinking about, is this mind so brilliant, so advanced, so raw, so primitive, so in touch, what would they have done if they didn't die? What would they have given us if they didn't? And that's where I have a tough time dealing with it. Are we talking about dying in the middle of, you know, a project piece? Yes. Or are we talking about yeah. yeah, or just like this or anything. Yeah. Like, you know, Pauline Hanson purposely dying for an art project, right? For right. Art. Or that's Being the, the art piece concept. itself, the death. Right. 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 right? And then, the like, say, itself. through that death, does that then put you in a different place, and does that then elevate your ideas? But has that happened? Uh, I mean, like a murder, yeah. it's martyrdom. Yeah. Or the murder, like, yeah. Martyr. Yeah, like I don't deny that. I don't deny that. Is 
Who made the comment about the World Trade Center? Greatest working part. Was it Dave Members? Yeah. The way yeah, yeah, I believe you made that comment. Yeah, and that just blew my mind. It just, I mean, how do you reckon with that? I mean, as, as a human, and our ultimate duty, I would think, is to preserve humankind, which is lost in many different ways today. Um, I remember hearing that and just... But I mean, that guy is wrapped up in did, some did morbid he, did he death just want to thing just anyway. Say that before someone else said it. That's I basically just, how I took it. What, what has he made that hasn't been skulls. like dealing with death yet? Like it's dead flies, it's dead skulls, skulls it's butterflies. You know, it's, it's like dead, 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 dead. yeah. He, it's true. So he just, so he it's wishes. Not a surprise. But I mean, maybe he, that's what he wishes. He could taxidermy. The three thousand people that died in nine eleven, and show that. Turn it into a spectacle. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but he is. Yeah, there's also people like That's Teresa right. Margolis who like get the blood um, from morgues of murder victims in Mexico from drug crimes, and then she mixes it with a mop and mops people's floors with this blood mixture. And the pieces that are at the Bass Museum right now, those low um, tables, those are mixed with. Um, Blood and chemicals from morgues for murder victims, like things like that. I mean, and they're inviting, and you want to sit on them until you find out what's. And then you realize that they're made of like these things, and then suddenly you're implicated in this situation, and I mean. Then you feel uncomfortable, and you're like, oh, I don't want to sit there anymore because you know what's behind it. And that's not shock value, that's that's more like that's the icing on the cake. That's like, yeah, that's the truth. So it's a way of accessing truth. About a condition or a situation. Sorry. No. <laughs> no. Sally, it's, it's... Sally Mann, you know the photographer Sally Mann. She did a whole series on studying people's uh, decomposition, dead people, and how they decompose. And she was an amazing uh, exhibit. But she, she didn't went, die. She didn't die. <laughs> well, of course, when God she didn't die, so she do more art. But it was a, quite a, quite an experience. You know. Yeah, I think, that. I think there's a big difference between like shock value and confrontation. And I think, you know, there's there could be a cheapness to shock value, but mm-hmm. to really confront something, then I think that's valuable. Maybe that is what you're after. I think that's a great statement. Um, I got here a little late. Did you guys talk about the boat at the mm-hmm. out there already? The what? Yeah. Just briefly. Just briefly, all right. Yeah, because the Pope recently retired, so that was like kind of Do you think I caused that? I would hope so, actually. But, uh,. We were just trying to get him laid, was really the whole uh, <laughs> Well, who knows, maybe he is going to be laid now, because he's retired. Sweetheart. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure it's good. Okay. Should we have a, a last round of uh, comments? Um, you can still have me stumped on the abstract painting and the relation emotionally to what you're doing. I think it's an amazing question and it's, it's going to sit in my head. So <laughs> I probably have to start writing about it. That's because I do think there's a connection. I, I really do. And I almost think it's kind of like what you're doing. It is, it's more of a, a ticket, a front row seat in front of that painting and it's okay to have your own experience. Whereas, what's that person thinking next to me? Or what's that person writing about it that I'll read or not read? Or what are they getting that I'm not getting? Um, and I kind of think that, you again, you're just sort of, to punch, you're punching people that it's okay. So that's, that's what I'm thinking, like, you know, when I'm in front of the de Kooning or the Gorky or something as minimal as... Uh, uh, yeah, but don't you think, like, now you go look at a Rothko and like there's this build up where you're supposed to be like 
immersed in this color and you're supposed to get this like warmth or chill or feeling because it's it's been written about and it's been like built up and no not not for me and I feel lucky in that context not for me I not not whatsoever that that's maybe I that's maybe why we're artists because we have that okay within us so we can see if that rock flow speaks to us or doesn't or didn't and does um, and does I, like I, if there's a good writing, if, if the person is sort of has a great track record and sort of, you know, is cheered on by, you know, people of the same peer or not, or aspiring to be, I think that's fine. If it's a buffoon or a sensationalist, then I probably wouldn't. But again, that a lot of times that's a fine line. And do you think that him spilling whatever that was to make, like, putting that emotion into those, was that the cause that then made him kill himself in his studio? I'm not aware of that. I don't. I can't comment on that. Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, that goes back to the, the biggest question about Van Gogh. I mean, I like to believe that he was immense. He was so immense in such incredible beauty that all of a sudden, well, there you have it. There's your, there's your question. There's the gun. I, that's how I like to think about it. And I, I've, I've given it so much thought, that's where I arrive. That he was just so overwhelmed with the most intense amount of beauty of nature that he made peace with it. And of course, it's a nice fantasy. Was, I'm sorry? It's a nice fantasy. <laughs> it works for me. Yeah, yeah. You're writing. I hate to say it. You're writing a narrative into something that's. I've been well, you sort of there. I think we've all been sort of there. That's still your personal narrative you're writing. Into exactly, and I mentioned it. Well, who else? Who, who haven't we heard from that wants to speak up? Well, in regards to what they've been telling you about your show, about like how to outdo the show that you did before with the shock value and everything, I think that you shouldn't try to outdo what you did. I think you should continue on the path that you were on. It's like if you're trying to you're trying to create a sequel. You're trying to do a Transformers 2. And if you do that, then you're not creating a genuine work. You're trying to like get that same that same um, that, that same feel, that same audience to be like, oh you did it again. What does that say, Raphael, about using danger? I mean, why why use danger? Why not use danger? Is because it produ is it productive it, it, to use danger or not? Because it, it got the attention that time. So it's like let's throw some more explosions in there and some more like Stuff transforming and stuff, but that—that's not where you were. And that's not where you first came with the people, with the show. You weren't like, all right, let's get these people to be shocked by what I do. Let's let's put together a really great show. Let's not outdo ourselves. Like you're not gonna go back into it and be like, let's do that with times a hundred. But the, through this like trial and error process, like. I'm building this formula of how to create a good show. Mm -hmm. And that's what you find. You find out what works, you find out what doesn't work. And try not to get to caught in these paths of like, oh, you're the weapons artist and you make guns and crossbows and I want one for my backyard. Uh, could you capture that essence <laughs> without having to do another carnival ride thing? Right, and that's what I'm, I'm looking for, is like, how do I, like, jump themes, yeah. but continue that, that motion and that power throughout that? Like, Follow. if I make a piece, and I get a, I get a reaction from someone, I don't say, why did I make that piece again, but I gotta make it look bigger, or I gotta make it better. I just gotta keep doing what I'm doing, and put in that same sort of feel, and that, just in, Continue improving within myself, not for the, that same person, that same reaction. Like if Van Gogh had gotten, if he had gotten the kind of attention that you would today, I don't feel like he would have gotten to the point that he, had, that he got to when he went to France, started doing his haystacks, started going more into his, his mind. <laughs> I'm going to square a little piece of paper and see what you think. 
you do on that piece of paper with the same intensity as your show. depends on where you take it as like the viewer like you could leave something in the realm of like oh that shocked me like that's elephant shit and leave it at that yeah, but then the like if you really um, <coughs> deal with it and you know pursue well, it look up the cabinets for something else yeah because like, cause, like yeah, I remember like that particular point like reading in some National Geographic magazine whatever wherever online like, you know, people in Africa use, you know, elephant dung to, to make plaster walls. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's like, that's kind of like a, it's like, oh, shock value, but it's not, it doesn't really take you anywhere. It's just like, oh, cool, because it's, it's a fun, you know, it doesn't teach you about anything else, I don't think, right? There's a, there's a certain shock value to the people who put cow dung or, or elephant dung on walls, mm -hmm. so. But then at a point, like, for them, it's just practical. Yeah. So, so, so shock value leads, leads to other uh, white people understand there's a sort of practicalness to that shock value. But there's a difference between like shock value and like a knowing provocativeness, such right. as someone like Renzo Martin is traveling down a river with a big neon sign that says enjoy poverty in a river in an impoverished part of, um, I'm not exactly sure where it is, if it's in Africa or but like deliberately using that tactic to like be provocative. Um, but who's to say? For I guess that's what I was talking about. With, like it's trying to judge morality. Like uh, I think most people in this room would agree that you know doing something for to really incite something that's idealistic and changes the world—that's what art should go for. But who's to say that that tawdry sort of shock value kind of thing is valid? You know, I mean, it might be something that was extremely shocking to me as a high schooler. Um, I saw this, you know, this artist is just trying to provoke me. He's trying to 
whatever. Whereas, you know, Shock value and being a bully, too. There's a certain amount of bullying that goes on. <laughs> it doesn't have any social like, significance. It doesn't help. Bullying can be very shocked and have a very strong shock value. Bullying? Bully, like a bully, like say, if you pick, like say if you're a bully, bully, like say growing up, bully. Yeah, pick but on like people. in what There's sense? a certain shock value to that being a bully. There's a certain amount of art, artistry that goes with being a bully, you know. Provoking, like, uh, like say if you're picking on a gay person, for instance, that okay. a bully. There's a certain amount of shock value. Sure. That, yeah. Which is a very different thing than what we're talking about here. Right. We've thought of breaking out. Are there bullying artists? Yeah. Well, I mean,